uh, today uh, we have a special event uh, about African politics. Uh, also today we'll host two distinguished professors from uh, different uh, places. Um, uh, also uh, uh, today's program uh, is uh, it's gonna focus on on the Ethiopian uh, political crisis and uh, uh, also Turkey-Africa relations in the context of uh, Ethiopian crisis, Turkish perspective on the Ethiopian crisis. Uh, well, uh, before we start, uh, uh, I need to I need to thank for uh, for our faculty our, for our department of political science and international relations, uh, Ordam, uh, Middle East and Africa Research Center uh, of the University, uh, Akem uh, Africa Coordination and Training Center. Uh, I am very thankful for uh, for for. Uh, uh, helping uh, when we organize this program. Um, uh, about the program, uh, let me give you a brief information. Uh, the speakers uh, are going to talk uh, for only for 30 minutes, uh, not, not a long talk uh, today we will have. Uh, and then uh, I hope we are going to have uh, very dynamic section about answer and answer and question. Um, uh, uh, in, in, in, uh, right now, uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Awol Allo. Dr. Uh, Awol Allo, uh, by the way, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, I have to also thank for the participants uh, from different uh, universities from different uh, research centers, and uh, really, I am very thankful for uh, for the participants, especially this time. Uh, well, that's a, a really a huge sacrifice. Uh, thank you so much. I hope we are going to have uh, a very good program uh, and a fruitful program. Uh, yes, right now, uh, let me introduce Dr. Awon. Dr. Awol, uh, uh, he was born in Ethiopia. Um, he obtained a law degree at Addis Ababa University in 2006, a master's degree at the University of uh, Notre Dame uh, in the United States in 2008. And uh, he obtained his PhD at the University of Glasgow in 2013, specializing in the role of law and legal institutions in enabling progressive social and political change. Dr. Awol Awo joined uh, Kiel University as a lecturer in law in 2016. Prior to joining Kiel Law School, Dr. Awo taught at the London School of Economics and Political Science in 2013. Um, uh, his uh, speech is about political crisis, subsequent conflicts in Ethiopia since 2018 and geopolitical implications. We are very uh, happy that uh, Dr. Awol uh, accepted our kind invitation uh, because he's also uh, uh, he's specializing in African politics and uh, as an Ethiopian, he's uh, also uh, making a, a significant contribution to the uh, media and international research centers. Right, again, once again, I'm uh, very thankful for him. About Yunus Turhan, uh, Dr. Yunus Turhan uh, is a lecturer at Osmaniye Korkut Ata University in Turkey. He obtained his master's degree from Hacettepe University in the Department of International Relations. Following that, he completed his doctorate in the Department of International Relations at the Middle East Technical University in 2019. During his PhD studies at the Middle East, 
He was also a visiting research fellow at Oxford University from 2017 to 2018 with a Turitak scholarship. Dr. Turan also lived and studied in South Africa and has taken part in humanitarian projects in sub-Saharan African countries. His present research covers Turkey-Africa relations, politics of non-state actors, politics of foreign aid, and faith-based and secular non-governmental organizations. Today, Dr. Yunus Turhan, uh, also he will focus on the perspective on Turkey-Ethiopia relations in the context of Tigray crisis. And also, I'm very thankful for, uh, for, for uh, Dr. Turhan to accept our kind invitation. And really, I appreciate for both of the scholars. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, if if you don't mind, I would Hi. like to uh, I would like to uh, uh, start with Dr. Awol. Uh, Dr. Awol, do you mind that if you could start for the uh, for the uh, program? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you for uh, that very kind introduction and also uh, for the invitation to you to. Um, to Ubaidullah and uh, everyone who has been supporting behind the scenes. Let me just share the uh, PowerPoint. I told you it is a very basic, almost juvenile PowerPoint that I have. Um, let me just share it. Uh, just give me a signal if you can see it. it says uh, it's being shared now but uh, yeah do you see it can you see it yes okay so um the topic that i was given is uh the ethiopian crisis implications for uh, regional geopolitics and uh, my assessment is that you cannot really talk about today's crisis or even previous major crisis that led to armed confrontation in Ethiopia without addressing the foundational uh, issues at the heart of the Ethiopian state. So it's important that I go back uh, to the beginning and, and begin there. So the modern Ethiopian state was founded towards the end of uh, the 19th century by uh, Emperor Menelik. Uh, and the state formation and the subsequent nation building project or main nation building model that has been pursued by various governments over the course of time in Ethiopia are significant in terms of understanding the crisis that we face today and also the likely crisis uh, that we face as a country uh, going, uh, going forward. Now, um, when, when we speak of the, the kind of source of the, the crisis today, and I say the formation of the Ethiopian state is uh, one factor. This is uh, a process that is accompanied by significant violence, particularly Menelik southward uh, expansion uh, was particularly violent. And that history has given rise to a particular kind of narrative on the part of those who are on the margin of Ethiopian politics uh, to mobilize and organize uh, themselves. And the nation building process as distinct from the process of state formation itself is also very central. Almost all nation building models that were attempted, one uh, by Menelik, Haile Selassie, the Derg, were particularly problematic, but even the political settlement Ethiopia had in 1991 that tried to address the underlying political policy was also problematic in terms of how the process actually worked uh, in practice. So I'll talk about some of those key periods, key moments, and how uh, an unresolved political problem ultimately led to uh, the crisis that is destabilizing Ethiopia uh, today. Now, when the 1974 revolution started, or before the 1974 revolution, Ethiopia is almost a medieval type empire. That is uh, uh, a medieval type uh, multi-ethnic empire. Uh, that is characterized by political repression, uh, economic uh, marginalization, cultural subordination, and all of these uh, nefarious practices are essentially indexed uh, to ethnicity. 
uh, when the 1974 revolution came as a result of the student movements of the 1960s that articulated some of the key political questions in the country at the time, uh, there were two central questions, central political questions. One is what is often called uh, the question of nationalities, which basically means the demand on the part of various ethnic groups who live in the country for the right to self-determination. By that, I mean the right of these groups to determine their political, economic, and cultural status, either as part of the Ethiopian state or outside the Ethiopian state, basically because the right to self-determination uh, could be an internal self-determination or could be an external self-determination, which could lead to independence as well. But, but the key ask was the right to self-determination, which begins from the right to self-government at the local level, but could go out to becoming independent because some groups did have uh, that intention as well. The other central question uh, during this period was the land question. Uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, before the revolution in Ethiopia was a feudal empire because the way in which the land system worked in the country uh, basically makes the country a classic uh, feudal state. Uh, that was one of the central questions, uh, particularly in the, 19, uh, in the 1960s. And that, that question was addressed uh, by the Dirk, but these are the two central questions uh, of the period. Now, out of these two central questions emerged what I call two central visions for the future. This is not particularly related to the second question, which is the land question, because the land question really gets resolved when the Dirk takes over. But the right to self-determination, which existed as a central question at the time, and of course, the, the, the, uh, the view that the existing state had at the time led or gave rise to two central visions about Ethiopia and, and the way in which Ethiopia should be structured, what Ethiopia's identity should look like, what kind of future uh, are possible in Ethiopian state. So those two visions could really be summarized as, as a unitary and centralized, centralizing vision uh, that is aligned with the existing states um, and particular groups that had uh, political hegemony and dominance at that time and what could be described as a federal decentralizing vision, the idea that is primarily promoted by those who sought the right to self-determination, wanting a vision of the future where uh, regional states at the regional level have their own autonomy at the center, they could co-govern, but in some cases, right to self-determination could also be understood as something giving rise to the right to become an independent, uh, state. So these are the two central visions that emerge really out of that revolutionary moment. And I think still today, Ethiopia has not managed to effectively answer that question. And what underpins today's political and military crisis is precisely uh, the nation's or the country's inability to address this question uh, effectively. So let me just um, say a few things about the Derg period. So as I was saying, the Derg effectively addressed the land question. Uh, which basically really transformed Ethiopia from a feudal empire into a kind of a Marxist, Leninist military dictatorship. It's really neither Marxist, Leninist, but at least used that ideology, uh, talked about uh, the need to uh, make the means of production public, uh, but this is a highly authoritarian regime. Uh, it failed to address the major political question, that is the question of nationalities, uh, effectively, uh, repressed all forms of opposition at the time, uh, known for what is called the rare terror. This is a, a campaign of terror uh, that was conducted from 1975 up to 1977. Some would say uh, it goes up to 1978 as well. Uh, huge number of people were killed. Um, estimates to the lower end, I think, is around 30,000. The higher upper end uh, goes up to 750,000. As is always the case in Ethiopia, whenever you have violence on this scale, it's very difficult to know how many people actually have lost their lives. We don't know, for example, how many people have been killed uh, in the war uh, today. Uh, but the Dirk, precisely because he rejected the central political question in the country, was unwilling to address through a peaceful means. He was confronted his entire period 
with an armed insurgency, ultimately a coalition of several international movements overthrew the Turk and Eritrea became an independent state. Uh, and then uh, Ethiopia, a more reduced country, um, became a multinational federal state, multinational federal state. So that uh, moves us from the Dirk region regime to uh, the EPRDF uh, period. So EPRDF, uh, a coalition of uh, four uh, ethnic-based political organizations. Uh, there is a lot that can be said about EPRDF, but you know, the purpose is really not to give you the details of uh, how this political organization has evolved. Uh, but the EPRDF period, uh, Ethiopia got a new political settlement that theoretically addressed the national question. And those long-standing demands for autonomy, self-government at the local level, cultural development, uh, linguistic justice, those questions have been addressed and they were secured by way of a new constitution that came into force in 1991. Uh, uh, but the problem, the central problem with the system is that it failed to democratize the federal system. And if federal as a, as a, as a political uh, system is not democratic, the whole point of really going federal uh, becomes not meaningless, but highly problematic because that in and of itself could generate further crisis that could ultimately lead to other problems. And I think that is precisely uh, what happened uh, in Ethiopia. So the system was not democratic. Uh, the right that people were given by way of the constitution to govern themselves at the local level have not been effectively uh, practiced or implemented. Uh, the system was highly authoritarian. Uh, in terms of silencing dissent and opposition, uh, and several political organizations that uh, stood up against uh, the government were designated terrorist organizations, they were eliminated from the political sphere, then long simmering political conflict over a long period of time exploded into uh, uh, uh, an open revolt in 2015, mainly when the Oromo protest uh, started. Now, what you really have, what is interesting to me is, is that the Oromo protest, in terms of this you know, genealogy of the Ethiopian state that I'm giving you, the Oromo protest is by uh, a population that is interested in um, creating a federal system that is effective, that is democratic, that could work and deliver on the question of self-determination. And the forces that initially gave Ethiopia this political settlement, EPRDF, TPLF, were also forces that ideologically believed in the idea of a federal Ethiopia that is diverse, that is pluralistic, uh, that respected and recognized the differences and identities that existed within the Ethiopian state. So it's basically a collusion between two forces that fundamentally believed in a federal structure, in the idea of a federated Ethiopia that ultimately led uh, to the uh, change in government in uh, 2018. And this is interesting because of what happens, uh, what happens later. So uh, mainly Oromos protesting, but also uh, Amharas uh, and other groups, but primarily it is a movement driven by uh, the Oromo protest, a peaceful uh, grassroots uh, movement, ultimately led to uh, the change in government, um, and Abiy Ahmed came to power. Now, when Abiy came to power, as a result of this collusion, as I said, between two uh, groups that had a federalist vision of the future, uh, at the beginning, Abiy promoted a positive, uh, I think, hopeful um, um, uh, let's say plans or uh, uh, visions. Uh, he, you know, very uh, uh, boldly uh, invoked the ideas of uh, human rights, uh, uh, constitutionalism, the rule of law, uh, the need to build uh, consensus, uh, the need to promote national uh, reconciliation and healing in Ethiopia. Uh, he wasn't just talking about those things, he was also taking 
uh, uh, real practical steps on the ground by way of releasing political prisoners or reforming uh, past repressive legislations. Uh, and I think trying to put uh, a more uh, kind of uniting and, and a positive spin on even some of the most divisive historical accounts of the past. A lot of people, including myself, believe that this is precisely the kind of leaders that Ethiopia needed to get over the line and start that journey towards a democratic future. But of course, little did we know that Abi uh, believed in one thing and did completely uh, something else. Uh, he, as soon as he came to power, began consolidating power. Uh, after effectively consolidating power within uh, the military, within the security, within the civil service, uh, putting key individuals that he trusts in, in, in uh, key places, uh, he basically betrayed the Oromo and, and Federalist cause and moved towards a more centrist idea of the future. Now, it, the, the, the current prime minister uh, comes from the Oromo wing of the former EPRDF coalition. Uh, that coalition was effectively uh, a coalition that was supported by the protest movement. Uh, the protest movement and key individuals within that party uh, decided to put Abiy Ahmed ahead. Maybe I think some could question the extent to which the protest movement played a part in, in putting Abiy first. But certainly, I don't think anybody would question the role, for example, Lama Magersa played in putting Abiy Ahmed to a position of the prime minister. Once he consolidated power, Abiy started eliminating the pan oromo nationalist political movements and organizations. Uh, he sidelined Lama Magersa and ultimately fired him from his position. He imprisoned, for example, uh, the kind of the people who uh, drove the movements that uh, led to that change, people like Joar Muhammad, Bekele Gerba, these are now uh, in jail. Uh, Lama Magersa uh, is outside the country. Uh, and ultimately, Abiy thought that the best way he could uh, uh, impose his vision of the future on Ethiopia is by embracing uh, what I described as the Amhara vision of the future. That initial project that was started by Menelik that has no place for uh, uh, uh, plurality, diversity, uh, the coexistence of multiple uh, cultures along one another without one culture subordinating another culture, something that can only be accommodated in the context of a multinational uh, federal system. So Abi essentially uh, sidelined everyone, uh, embraced what I refer to as the Amhara vision. Um, you could uh, call this in other ways the project of uh, making Ethiopia great again uh, in the image of those uh, early uh, founders of the Ethiopian state. Uh, okay. Dear Dr. Abu, if you don't mind, please, could you make your sick, sick, sick screen uh, bigger? It is uh, now very small. We can't read Is it? Right. Or um, let me see. Or Ubedullah, how we can make it? Mm, uh, maybe you can close the design ideas section in your screen. And uh, uh, it's. Or never mind. Or never mind. Yeah. People sorry. can't. You, you can't really see it. Uh, uh, we can see, right but it is better. Right now, it is better. Okay, I will try and expand it. I can't do all of them at once, but I'll try. No, it is better. Uh, okay. Okay, so after consolidating power and initially muzzling political opposition within the Oromia regional state, which is the largest region politically significant where he himself comes from. So is there a significant opposition to his rule within Oromia, his powers would significantly be undermined, not just in terms of how people see him, but also how he's perceived by uh, other groups. Once he has marginalized that group, uh, the prime minister basically began taking uh, major uh, structural changes unilaterally that kind of changed the constitutional uh, 
uh, architecture of the state itself. So without changing the constitution, taking certain administrative measures that would have the impact of reconfiguring the constitutional setup uh, in the country. One of, I think, the most significant steps that Abi has taken unilaterally, uh, which in my view contributed significantly to the current crisis is his decision to dissolve EPRDF and create the Prosperity Party, uh, basically in his own image. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with dissolving EPRDF um, and there is nothing wrong with reforming EPRDF. That is precisely what people have been calling for. That system did not work as much as people wanted it. Uh, but the way in which EPRDF was dissolved, it was basically illegal. And the way in which the prosperity party was created, a political party that did not reflect the existing social cleavages and the existing political fault lines that have emerged over the course of the last 40, 50 years. So he created something entirely new. And the concern for a number of people, including myself, was that how is this party going to win any election? We know at that point it was very clear that Abi is uh, not considering leaving office if he lost election. It's also not something that is supported anyway by the history of the country. So if Abi could not win an election, that of course would put the entire transitional process in a different context. And it's very clear that in places like Romia, in places like Somali region, in Tigray, in much of South, a political party whose allegiance is primarily to the idea of the Ethiopian state, something that a lot of people identify with one particular ethnic group, namely the Amhara, and an idea that people understand and perceive as particularly exclusionary and hegemonic, it was quite clear that we are looking or heading towards a very dangerous future. So it was clear the Prosperity Party could not win an election. And Abi Ahmed, of course, has to postpone an election. He was particularly lucky that COVID uh, struck and he used COVID as a public health emergency to postpone the election. But that did not convince a lot of the opposition uh, groups. And under the kind of transitional process that Ethiopia was engaged in, it was absolutely crucial for him to get the consensus of the various stakeholders before uh, postponing uh, the election and, and extending the terms of office of the government. And that is one of the reasons why the Abiy government and the Tigray regional government um, that effectively put them on a collusion course and it triggered a chain of uh, events that uh, ultimately uh, led to uh, this war. Of course, the Tigray uh, People's Liberation Front uh, objected to the way in which the Prosperity Party was created and EPRDF was dissolved. There was long simmering uh, political tension between Abiy and them uh, since he came to power, but the formation of the Prosperity Party and the uh, postponement of the election were two major events that are of constitutional uh, um, significance uh, and that led to a major constitutional crisis ultimately uh, to this devastating war that we have seen. Now, uh, let me just... So I think everybody knows that this war uh, is now over one uh, year old. Uh, started on the 4th of November last year. Uh, we have seen uh, escalating violence across uh, the entire country with the war going beyond combatants embracing uh, civilians. We saw uh, mass atrocities in the form of uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes. Uh, in some cases, uh, allegations of genocide, uh, mass displacement of population, major humanitarian crisis. Uh, according to the United Nations, uh, in Tigray, uh, close to 400,000 people uh, are on the verge of uh, famine. Uh, probably, I think that number uh, is an older number. Um, so, you know, what we have now is this unprecedented levels of political polarization and division that has significantly damaged the social fabric 
I think we all, Ethiopians, people who are interested in politics, we all know at least someone that we thought were reasonable, rational, could have a reasonable dis, you know, conversation, reasonably disagree on something. And suddenly we began to see that person in a completely different light. That the person that we thought reasonable were, at least in our perception from where we stand politically, is literally a fascist. So, so the, the division is so deep that it has really raised this question of whether Ethiopia could continue as a state going forward. So the risk of uh, political implosion uh, is something that various experts and actors uh, have, have alluded to. And of course, uh, a political disintegration in Ethiopia would have a significant uh, ramification uh, for the entire uh, Horn of Africa region. Now, so that is kind of the, the uh, a broad uh, brush, broad outline of what led to, uh, to the war. Still, this war fundamentally is an ideological, a political war. The reasons for the war are political in the sense that Abiy Ahmed wants to impose a particular idea of the future without following due process, without, for example, changing the constitution in ways that is consensual. I think it's absolutely fine if Abiy had a political vision that is anathema to significant number of people, but insofar as that is done in a way that is constitutionally grounded, that's absolutely fine. But the problem was that the government uh, has resolved at some point that the only way they can change what they call this hateful system is through uh, forcefully uh, imposing a new constitutional system. Uh, it, is, it is that process that ultimately led uh, to this war. And we now, uh, as a country, uh, are in this stalemate where, uh, you know, until very recently, the uh, Tigray Defense Forces uh, uh, had a military momentum on their, on their side. Uh, more recently, over the last two weeks, it seems as if the government has uh, a momentum. Uh, it's not really clear to me uh, what's going on over this uh, two, two uh, weeks time. The Tigray Defense Forces withdrew from significant parts of the country that they occupied um, uh, in a very orderly fashion. Um, they didn't fight, uh, but at the same time, the government is claiming, uh, claiming victory. Uh, and it's not the end of the war. And the question really is, and I think the, the issue that this particular group is interested in is, uh, what would be the implication of this uh, for, uh, for the region? Now, in my view, uh, I think there are implications, for example, if the Ethiopian state is to collapse. Uh, the Ethiopian state is a, it's not a very old state, although according to some, uh, the uh, the early um, Ethiopian states uh, was a state that began some 3,000 years ago. Uh, that's legend. Uh, it's, there's no historical uh, evidence to that. Uh, but the modern Ethiopian state um, is about 140, 150 years uh, old. And this is a multi-ethnic empire uh, that have various ethnic groups with different ideas of what Ethiopia is, with different accounts of Ethiopia's history, collective memory, uh, Ethiopia's future. And the, the, the fact that there are these two uh, uh, competing and irreconcilable visions of the future that now lead to the war has led so many people to uh, predict that the Ethiopian states could uh, collapse unless uh, an amicable political settlement uh, is not is not reached. So, so the risk of disintegration or state collapse is great. If Ethiopia collapses as a state, this would be the greatest state collapse anywhere in the world because we are looking at very many ethnic groups. There are about um, 65 to 70 uh, groups. Some are uh, smaller, but the major groups uh, in of themselves are very, uh, very significant. Uh, the other 
kind of problem. So, so if Ethiopia is to disintegrate as a country, that would have significant ramification uh, for regions uh, in the Horn of Africa, for countries in the Horn of uh, Africa. I just wanted to kind of show you this map. If you look at, um, let me let me show you this uh, this map. So this is the new uh, regional map of Ethiopia, including the new state of Sidama and the state of Southwest. Um, if you look at this region, for example, Gambela, you have ethnic Nuer and Dinka who live predominantly in Gambela. Um, the those are the two predominant groups. But you also have this same group in South Sudan. In Ben Shangul, you have ethnic groups who also significantly live on the other side. Uh, the Somali regional state, you have ethnic Somalis, of course, the Somali state itself is um, on, on, on the east. Uh, you have in Afar, uh, ethnic Afaris in Eritrea. Uh, you have uh, societies that are culturally quite proximate uh, in Tigray and um, uh, in, in Tigray and Eritrea. So the implication, as you can see here, is that if Ethiopia was to disintegrate, maybe some of this group might want to join their neighboring, uh, uh, their, their uh, groups uh, with whom they have significant cultural, linguistic, uh, uh, and, and ethnic affinity in, in these neighboring countries. And that could create significant problems uh, for, the new, uh, for the new countries. Um, and also, of course, uh, for others as well, uh, in terms of, um, you know, various undemarcated regional boundary issues. Uh, Oromia, for example, uh, kind of borders almost every state uh, except the uh, state of Tigray. Uh, there are boundary uh, disputes between uh, some of, with, with some of this, uh, this region. So, so that would create significant, I think, implication um, for peace. Uh, and stability in the Horn of Africa region. I think countries like Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, uh, Eritrea. Uh, if you look at Somalia today, for example, Ethiopia used to play a very significant role with AMISOM and outside AMISOM in terms of providing uh, stability. Um, and Ethiopia now has withdrew um, its, its forces. The AMISOM um, affiliated forces, I believe, are still there. Uh, but that, I think, significantly undermines the ability of the uh, Somali government to uh, provide peace and security. South Sudan, highly fragile country. Sudan uh, had a very peaceful relationship with uh, Ethiopia until recently, but uh, relations are now turning sour due to um, this unresolved, long-standing uh, land dispute. Eritrea, of course, uh, had a long-standing issue uh, with Ethiopia, uh, and none of these countries could really escape the impact uh, that a disintegration of Ethiopia or instability in Ethiopia would have. The other interesting feature of regional uh, and geostrategic implication of the crisis has to do with foreign interventions. Um, I think you all know uh, that at the moment, uh, countries like the United Arab Emirates, uh, Turkey, Iran, um, uh, of course, China, or even Russia uh, are in some ways uh, intervening in this conflict, particularly, I believe, on the part of the government. And this is the process that kind of started a few years ago. Well, not all of them, but at least especially in terms of the Middle Eastern countries, UAE, for example, that's providing uh, significant support to the Ethiopian government. Uh, the, I think that the process kind of started uh, around 2019, specifically uh, with, no, 2018 uh, with Ethiopia. So this is when relations between Horn of Africa uh, countries and, and Arab nations began to change because of profound uh, geopolitical shifts uh, in the Middle East. Uh, you remember the war in, in, in Yemen, the uh, crisis within the um, uh, GCC, uh, as a result of that significant number of countries uh, on, uh, on the west of the, the Red Sea began, let me just accept somebody that's trying to come in. Uh, so relations between, so countries west of the Red Sea began uh, to kind of secure a political and military footprint 
in uh, countries east of the Red Sea, partly as a result of the war in Yemen. So UAE, for example, established a base and very actively engaged with Eritrea. Uh, and it was using that base to prosecute the war uh, in Yemen. Uh, but also other countries have been trying to secure their own uh, political footprints by way of investing in strategic assets. So Turkey invested very significantly, uh, about half of the near close to 6 billion uh, investment that Turkey has in, uh, in, in Africa. Let me just accept these people um, because the uh, hosting is, is given to me. So um, Turkey, uh, Invested significantly. Uh, that also has to do not just with uh, pursuing economic interests, but also about having political influence. So, as a result of this this, uh, this uh, political antagonism within uh, Middle Eastern countries, I believe around 19, 2018 we had this axis that kind of emerged, competing with one another. So, on the one hand, you have the Qatar-Turkey axis uh, that uh, stands in opposition to what I call the Arab axis, including countries such as, you know, led by countries such as Saudi Arabia and UAE, but also includes Bahrain and, uh, and Egypt. And then you have uh, Iran, uh, which is this proxies. Uh, it has also been trying to secure a footprint in the Horn of Africa. I understood Ethiopia's game around 2019 as one that is interested in leveraging and exploiting this geopolitical battle in, on, on the Horn of Africa. But I think that also led to something else, the, the, the, the kind of role that they are playing at the moment. Because some of these countries have already invested, they thought that the best way to secure their interest is by supporting the government. So the UAE play, played a very significant role. Uh, at the beginning of the conflict in, in November last year. And then it stopped and we were told that UAE dismantled its base in Eritrea. Uh, but more recently, the information in the public domain showed that UAE was very actively uh, supporting the Ethiopian government. So the problem here is that if you have all of these actors participating in an internal conflict within Ethiopia, then of course that will lead to a significant problem. Um, so now all of these actors are supporting the states. What if, for example, the non-state actors that are fighting also begin to uh, solicit support from other actors that have their own specific political agenda, such as, for example, Egypt? Yeah. So if the Tigran side were to say that, well, if the Ethiopian side was to use foreign actors to carry out this genocidal campaign against us, what is there to prevent us morally and ethically from soliciting support to save ourselves and our people from extinction? I mean, framed in, in more you know, extreme uh, sense. So the consequence of that, I think, is turning Ethiopia into a Libya or into a Syria. But of course, Ethiopia is neither Libya nor Syria the kind of internal division, this, the, the tension between centrifugal and centripetal forces that I have been describing, this long-standing political question, the sheer diversity of the country means that if we find ourselves in a Libya kind of situation or uh, in a Syria type situation for a long, prolonged period of time, then really there may not be any, you know, may, there may not be Ethiopia to talk about, right? And that would intensify, I think, the violence, the displacement that we see, it would turn this already volatile uh, Horn of Africa region into uh, an ungovernable region. Uh, I'll stop there and uh, I'll come back to it during Q&A. I think uh, that's better. Right, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Awo, really. Uh, it was uh, very, very good, very uh, uh, great uh, presentation. Um, uh, yes, I think uh, it is better if also uh, Dr. Yunus, uh, he can uh, uh, make his presentation, then we can start uh, for the discussion. 
Um, uh, yes, uh, briefly, you talk about the history of the um, uh, of the Ethiopia. Uh, so, especially political systems, you mentioned that uh, well uh, throughout the history, uh, political system uh, in the Ethiopian government uh, has has evolved in the different um, uh, directions. And also, yeah, Abi Ahmed, especially today, uh, yeah, humanitarian crisis, you mentioned that uh, crime, according to UN, according to international organizations, uh, well, the current uh, government is uh, committing a crime. Um, uh, well, uh, impact of the war also, uh, well, uh, has uh, uh, different implications in the region. Uh, well, especially uh, the uh, Horn of Africa uh, has a very volatile uh, place uh, because of the uh, well, border disputes and uh, political instabilities, economic instabilities, famine, drought, etc. Well, yes, uh, multi-ethnic identity, especially not only in Ethiopia, Somalia, and Eritrea, Djibouti, well, those countries, they have multi-ethnic identity. Uh, but uh, the main question is how the governments uh, are going to manage, uh, are going to uh, manage these uh, multi-ethnic identities uh, in a successful model. Um, foreign intervention, intervention, you also highlight that uh, foreign intervention. Yes, there are many, um, uh, many international actors are involved in the region, as uh, Ali Mazoui, well, uh, well, he uh, mentioned, he's saying that, well, it's a, a valuable place, well, in the African continent, uh, uh, Red Sea is, uh, well, a very valuable place because of its strategic importance and geopolitical uh, uh, significance. Uh, right, yes, uh, definitely, all the actors, they have uh, interest. Uh, well, they are, um, uh, they want to keep, they want to protect their uh, strategic interest. Uh, but right now, uh, in Ethiopia is the, uh, the biggest country in the region and in terms of population. And also, uh, well, this situation uh, is uh, going to have a significant impact on the militarization of the region, which is a uh, very problematic for the future of the region. So because well, uh, economic stability uh, must be prioritized, political stability must be prioritized. But unfortunately, right now, in, in today's uh, conflict is gonna increase the militarization process in the region. Well, um, uh, great, really. Uh, well, uh, we, uh, we, we really got very good insight from your perspective, from your presentation. But uh, I hope that uh, we'll uh, listen to you when we start uh, for our question and answer uh, question and answer section. I think, uh, Dr. Yunus Turhan, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, now it's your turn. Ready? So kindly, please, uh, you could start for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Srada and the Dr. Uh, Allo. Uh, after this uh, great presentation, which I have benefited a lot, uh, uh, particularly uh, seeking the source of the conflict, which gained my attention a lot. And, uh, if the uh, moderator allow me at the end of the section, I have a few questions to you. <laughs> and of course, of course, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I especially wanted to keep uh, your speech uh, brief, so then we'll have more time for the questions. Uh, I think it will be more exciting for for the participants as well. Okay. So, can you see my presentation now? Yes. Yes. Yes. There's a big trick here. Good night, everyone. Again, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Turkey Ethiopia relations. Uh, in this presentation, I have divided my topics, my presentation into two parts. At the beginning, I will cover Turkey Ethiopia relations in a historical perspective. And the second part, I will touch upon briefly how the Tigray crisis 
may influence Turkey Ethiopia relations. So let's have a look at a brief uh, sort of Turkey Ethiopia relations. So I have divided this relation into three broad periods. First period, pre Ottoman era, and the second period, Ottoman period, and the third is modern period. Dr. So I'm sorry for interruption. Uh, could you uh, change your slide because it's stuck? I think on this on the first page. So uh, I moved. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, could no, he can't. Can you cannot see? Yeah, he cannot. He can. Why I don't know. So how about now? Uh, they do no, not I believe because because you are using a, a slideshow, we cannot see it. If you use your PowerPoint, uh, now yeah. we can see it, yes. Yeah, we can see it, great. So great. I, I made a big screen, that's why it didn't move. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now it's, uh, you can see it, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, the first period of uh, pro ottoman area, uh, as some of us know that uh, the, the presence of Turks and the Africa go, goes back to ninth and 10th centuries. And there were several states which were established by Turks located in the northern part of the Africa. However, we don't have that much uh, sources uh, in this period. So uh, I will just pass quickly this period to Ottoman period. So relations during the Ottoman era, Sultan Selim I conquered Egypt through the Battle of Merjidabek and the Redania uh, in 1560s and 1570s. So uh, the Ottoman Ethiopian relation within the concept of Portugal. So when we look at the, uh, uh, in the early period of Ottoman Ethiopian relations, there were two dimensions which shaped the, uh, the level of relations and interaction between two states. The first uh, issue was a uh, Portugal because uh, the Portuguese was a dominant actor in the Red Sea and Indian Oceans. And when the Ottoman conquered the northern part of Africa, and it automatically came across with the Portuguese sailors, and there were economic competition between Ottomans and Portuguese over Indian Oceans, which has automatically uh, influenced Turkey Ottoman to, uh, to Ottomans Ethiopian relation in regard to uh, in the context of uh, Portugal. And the second issue is uh, the securing the holy towns because the main uh, idea of Ottoman leaders to conquer this part of region to prevent any external threat coming from this region to do Saudi, Saudi Arabia, which we call as a holy town, Mecca and Jitta. So uh, the Turkish leaders at that time uh, pay attention to uh, beyond Egypt as well to secure any uh, threat which make which would come from these areas to uh, that uh, holy towns. So when we look at the eight, uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, actually at the time Ethiopia were was searching for Western alliance to balance Ottoman presence in 19th century. So. Even that period, we uh, I when I when I was uh, searching these period interactions, I have seen that uh, the importance of Ethiopia at the uh, at the eyes of Ottoman leaders has been reducing in in due course. So, uh, in the late nineteen and uh, er, uh, late eighteen and early nineteenth century. Ethiopia was not as it was not as significant as uh, in previous time, uh, and in 1896 was an important period to set a uh, French relation between Sultan Abdul Hamid and Emperor uh, um, uh, Menelik II. Uh, there was a case of Dar al Sultana Monastery because this monastery was a uh, important place for worship of Ethiopian Christians. Uh, however, Egypt, Egyptian Copts were uh, claiming that this monastery belongs to them and they were not allowing any Ethiopians to enter 
this monastery. So then Menelik, Menelik II asked assistance from Ottoman leaders uh, who later ordered to secure Ethiopian Christians worship in this monastery. So which opened a new chapter in Ottoman Ethiopia relations uh, in the late uh, 19th century. And soon after that, Ottoman consulate has opened uh, in Harar, uh, 1912. So when we look at the modern period, which is also divided into three uh, broad periods, which I call uh, early periods, and the second period, and the third period. So let's look at briefly in this each period. First period. Uh, I can describe this early period as two nations, but the same destiny, because there were many similarities between the early, early Turkish Republic and the Ethiopians because uh, the leadership role of Ras Tefari Mekonin, who was known as the, the Ataturk of Ethiopia and Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who was a, a founder of modern Turkish Republic. Uh, and the first embassy of Turkish Republic in Sub-Saharan Af Africa was opened uh, in Addis Ababa in 1923. Then the Ethiopia embassy is open in 1933. And uh, we have seen many, uh, uh, we have seen many uh, firm stance of Turkish authorities next to Ethiopia in the League of Nations against Italian invasions. And Turkey has condemned, uh, con uh, condemned uh, the Italian occupation, even sent several Turkish soldiers who fought alongside Ethiopian uh, soldiers. The second period, Cold War era, I described this period as a pendulum swings back and forth against a bad, a back and forth across friendship and fall. And uh, security seeking and ideological principle become the major role in framing relation in this period. Turkey's rejection to attend non-alignment movements where many African states were actively participating has reduced the credibility of Turkey among African leaders. Turkey has positions in the Western side by joining NATO at the early of the Cold War. The Ethiopia was the same side. And high level visits has taken place between Turkey and Ethiopian leaders. Uh, however, during the colonial Mangistu, the country has sided in, the, in line with the Soviet ideology. That's why Ethiopian embassy in Ankara was closed in 1984 during the common, uh, common, uh, communist regime. But in 1991, as my colleague just mentioned, uh, which was a historic moment uh, in the history of Ethiopia, also was a new chapter has opened between Ethiopia and Turkey relations in 1991. So we have seen may uh, uh, we have seen this period ethno-Turkish relation in flourishing. Tur two countries have signed several agreements, and Ethiopia op opened an uh, honorary consulate in Istanbul, 1996, and we reopened its embassy in 2006. And in 1998, Turkey Africa opening policy uh, has led uh, many high-level visits. Uh, and uh, starting of Turkish Airlines direct flights, establish, establishment of several Turkish NGOs operating in Addis Ababa and several parts of the Ethiopia, such as, for example, scholarship to Ethiopians. To date, 633 Ethiopians have been benefiting from Turkish, Turkish scholarship. So when we look at the relation in, in, in regard to economic dimension, in 2003, there was only one Turkish companies investing in Ethiopia and the number of employing people were just five. At present, nearly, Turkish, nearly 200 Turkish companies, which were ranging from construction, agricultural, manufacturing and chemical industry active in Ethiopia, who were employing, who are employing more than, more than 30,000 Ethiopians. The total investment of Turkey in Ethiopia, volume, surpassed $2.5 billion. 
and the 13, uh, 13 projects have been completed so far. Turkey is the most important investor country in Ethiopia after China. Bilateral trade volume between Turkey and Ethiopia amounted to just 27 billion in 2000, but reached nearly 400 million in 2019. And being one of the top three contrib contributors of foreign direct investment to Afghan fastest growing economy. Half of the Turkey's investment in African continent are, are located in Ethiopia. Turkey's imports from Ethiopia, which was $51 billion in 2019, just decreased to $18 million in 2021. These are the uh, the post, uh, these are the negative uh, consequence of Tigray crisis on Turkey Ethiopia relations because uh, the crisis uh, have not only influenced Turkey Ethiopia relations in economic per perspective but also political perspective as well. So now in this slide, I'm just focusing on economic perspective. So when we look at the uh, previous period before the crisis erupted. Uh, the ex import of Turkey Ethiopia was quite high, and even Turkey's exports, which were uh, 278 million in 2019, decreased 237 million dollar in 2021. So this crisis is hampering Turkey's uh, companies' investment in Ethiopia, including a railway construction which budget $1.7 billion and 1,200 kilometers. The project is now at standstill, nearly 93% completed. And Ethiopians dependence on tex textile sector and Turkey has been one of the major players for the growth of textile sector inside Ethiopian industries parks. Coffee, sashimi, and other soil seeds, vegetables, which make up, make up 70% of total export. And for example, sashimi export to Turkey uh, is the third uh, in terms of uh, budget. The list of Ethiopia's import by country, China ranks the first, Turkey ranks the third. When we look at what kind of items that Turkey uh, export to Ethiopia, and these are the major items steel machinery, iron, uh, mechanical devices, and tools. When we look at uh, the type of these tools, Turkey export so strategic items, which contribute to development of uh, Ethiopia's factory and, uh, and development. And politics and Tigray crisis may jeopardize Turkey's regional policy implications. As I have mentioned in 1998, Turkey has opened up a new policy, new Afghan policy. And this policy covers uh, to increase Turkey's uh, uh, economic investment in Africa, Turkey's diplomatic representative, representative, representatives, and Turkey's uh, even the hard power implication in the continent. So the crisis uh, directly jeopardized Turkey's regional policy implication. And it may also influence Turkey's Somali policy and presence. As, all, as everyone knows that Turkey has paid a special attention to Somali's development and democratizations. So this crisis, as my colleague just mentioned that, has potential to uh, destabilize the region, including Somali. So, uh, and the, uh, in this scenario, uh, Turkey, could come across any uh, many other uh, challenges to uh, to meet uh, this uh, its implication in the regions. Uh, the crisis may hazard Turkey's mediation role in the regions, and because uh, Ethiopia and Sudan uh, has declared that Turkish government's mediation uh, in regarding the Fashhaga Triangle uh, dispute. Mm, Turkey could play a, a mediation role. However, this crisis 
could uh, negatively influence uh, in this mediation role as well. And here is the final uh, presentation, final parts. When we look at Turkey's position in the Tigray crisis, Turkey stand a low of siding and positions, often urge a peaceful solution to crisis. When we look at on the ground, Turkish state institutions and NGOs have already widened humanitarian aid reaching throughout the whole region after Tigray crisis erupted. So when I told several Turkish NGOs operating in Ethiopia, they uh, confirming that many foreign NGOs, particularly humanitarian NGOs, have left the country due to the increasing uh, conflict. However, Turkish uh, NGOs uh, is, uh, is still locating uh, in Ethiopia and uh, sending aid uh, to the vulnerable people. And also we have seen, uh, we can see uh, these Number uh, increasing number of Turkish aid. Uh, it was just 0.63 million in 2008, just jumped to 3 million and 2 million in 2018 and 2020. Turkey strongly condemned all humanitarian human rights violations and abu uh, abuse occurring in Ethiopia. And Abi Ahmed signed a military cooperation agreement to buy Turkey's Bayraktar TB2 drones on a visit uh, to Ankara in August 2020. An allegation that the Ethiopian government used Turkish drones in Tigray has not been, conf has not been confirmed. And Tigray crisis would be a heavily political and financial cost to Ethiopia, which Turkey, which Turkey never wished to see a war torn economy. And everyone will lose out if conflict prevails and do not compromise in a peaceful solution. In a conclusion, conclusion remark, as, as I mentioned in the previous slides, Turkey has huge investments in Ethiopia, uh, economic, political, uh, and humanitarian investments. So these conflicts will may uh, uh, this uh, may, uh, how, how would I say, may uh, uh, reduce the Turkey's uh, presence in the country. So uh, this is the last scenario that Turkish authorities would like to see. Thank you so much for listening. Right. Okay. Thank you, dear Dr. Yunus Turhan. It was really uh, a very good presentation and also uh, yes, also very uh, interesting presentation. I believe that uh, we'll have many good questions for your uh, presentation. Well, uh, briefly also, I would like to highlight uh, uh, your points. Uh, historically, uh, you mentioned that well, Turkey is not a new actor in African politics. Turkey's uh, history is... Uh, is, is uh, going to, uh, uh, uh, well, in, in uh, 16th century, well, it has uh, very old historical relations uh, well, on the African continent. Also, uh, Turkey uh, has a very diverse relations with Ethiopia, not only with Ethiopia, but also with the countries in the Horn of Africa. Well, uh, diplomatic, economic, and political security relations, especially in the recent years, uh, Turkey uh, Africa relations uh, um, have been uh, booming in terms of the security relations. Uh, well, yes, uh, Tigray crisis uh, has a, a different uh, impact on the uh, Turkey's uh, economic relations, political, and security relations. Uh, yeah, you believe that uh, is going to have a, a negative impact on Turkey's presence in the region. Well, we can discuss to what extent and uh, how it's going to be affected. Uh, so we are going to uh, ask you uh, some questions. Okay, 
Um, uh, dear participants, right now, I think it is time for the uh, question and answer uh, question and answer section. Uh, we would like to take your questions. Uh, uh, right. Uh, uh, how we can raise your questions uh, directly, you can ask your questions to the speakers, uh, but kindly introduce, yours, introduce yourself briefly and uh, then point your questions to the speaker. Okay, well, uh, the, well before I got uh, your questions, uh, I would like, I have questions for Dr. Awol, Dr. Awol. Dr. Raul, uh, uh, as you know that, uh, yeah, you mentioned that, uh, well, there is, uh, yeah, there is a, a conflict in the, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, well, uh, of course, this uh, problem has a, a historical base. Well, uh, this problem uh, just didn't uh, start up. Well, uh, I think you said, well, it is a historical, well, um, uh, foundation. Uh, from your perspective, uh, well, uh, uh, because uh, the conflict uh, is is stabilizing the country, and also uh, is is uh, gonna give a, a significant uh, economic problems and security problems not only in the country but also in the region. So do you believe that Abi Ahmed uh, uh, is gonna stop the war and is gonna uh, have uh, inclusive politics uh, and uh, will uh, also, yeah, he, as we know that he got Nobel Prize, uh, but right now uh, many international research, uh, research centers and media, they are also, uh, well, voicing that Nobel Prize okay must be cancelled. Do you believe that uh, Abi Ahmed uh, is gonna uh, well change the history in Ethiopia, or uh, he's gonna uh, well uh, become is uh, uh, uh, gonna become well different uh, politician uh, in African politics? What's your idea? Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, having seen the events of the last one year, uh, where Ethiopia, a vast, significantly uh, important Horn of Africa region uh, with important institution, particularly if you look at, for example, the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, uh, these are forces that were widely regarded as very tough fighting forces that are disciplined. Uh, as a result of that, Ethiopia plays a very important role in uh, regional and international peacekeeping operations. It was at one point the largest contributor uh, to the United Nations uh, peacekeeping mission. And now when you look at where Ethiopia is today, as a result of the really significant blunders that have been made by the prime minister, uh, which significantly reflected on his ability to, um, you know, seriously process uh, the, the underlying fundamental issues the country is facing. It's very difficult to see how uh, Abiy could uh, get Ethiopia out of this uh, abyss and put it on a path uh, to a better future. It's really difficult to speak of Ethiopia now heading in the direction of democracy, but even to be able to hold the Ethiopian state together uh, after all this is a miracle. So it's very difficult to imagine how Abiy Ahmed could do that. And I, you know, the reason why I went back to Ethiopia's founding moment is precisely because Ethiopia until today is fighting the same war. If you look at the struggle during the student uh, movement in the 1960s and early 1970s, the 17-year war uh, between the Derg and various liberation movements. Of course, the Eritreans started fighting before that. Even the 1998-2000 war, the current, these are all conflicts that have their roots in the foundation of the Ethiopian state. The, 
state formation process was violent, and then subsequent nation building projects and the models that have been implemented have failed. Even when the model, at least theoretically speaking, is one that sparked to the underlying concerns of the majority of people, it wasn't properly implemented. That is the case with, for example, the 1991-2018 uh, uh, nation building project. Um, so the kind of vision of the future that Abiy Ahmed is offering the Ethiopian people is one that has been tried in the past and that has been resoundingly rejected. So the idea that Abiy Ahmed now can somewhat return Ethiopia to a certain past that has been rejected in the past in 2021 uh, with, within a world that has significantly changed, um, it's very difficult to even imagine the, the, the prospect of that happening. So for all those reasons, I have absolutely no hope in the ability of the prime minister uh, and its political judgment uh, and his personality to be able to lead steer Ethiopia uh, out of this storm. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, we can get uh, the question from our uh, participants. Dr. Yus, you you had a, you had questions. Huh? Yes, I think uh, until uh, the listener can ask question, I can ask question uh, <laughs> to Dr. Uh, Alo if uh, he allows me. Uh, I am quite impressed uh, uh, to uh, illustrating the source of the conflict, which you clearly indicated that. But uh, when the Abi came to power in 2018, and he was awarded a Nobel Prize, but soon after, not more than one year, he turned uh, a different path or he implicated different policy. So that I am just curious about how can a leader can easily quick can quickly return uh, from one policy to another policy within a year. And do you think that international, uh, international uh, state or, or, or the leaders uh, were quick to declare Abi as a uh, prosper leaders who may reach to Ethiopia as you describe as a prosper state? So how, what was the reason he was quickly changed uh, from a, a democratic, one of the most uh, popular democratic leader to more, one of the worst uh, autocratic leader within a year? Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a very difficult question, I think, to exhaustively answer, but I can give you my own assessment of the situation. Now, you know, as I said, when the prime minister came to office, it wasn't just him as an individual person. There was a movement behind him. There were also a range of individuals within his own party that people thought were able to control him, right? From, you know, going um, in his own way and, and uh, creating issues. People thought that there were people who were, uh, you know, ideologically and, and politically mature enough so that at least the transitional process would be grounded uh, and, and, and with the support of internal and external stakeholders, Ethiopia could potentially make it. But, you know, as soon as he assumed power for the first six months in office, everything that Abiy has done was spot on. You know, I, I am, you know, an outspoken critique of Abiy Ahmed now but I supported him early uh, in his career when he was doing the right kinds of things. Um, so as I said, he was uh, using very inclusive language of democracy, reconciliation, healing, uh, the need to build a national consensus, not just shoving your own idea down people's throats. Uh, he was also actually taking very concrete steps on the ground so people felt okay. This is precisely the kind of individual that this country needed. 
not just within Ethiopia, but beyond Ethiopia, the fact that he reached out, for example, to Eritrea uh, to uh, end the 20 years of no war, no peace situation. A lot of us saw that as a very bold and very um, you know, courageous move because there were groups that were opposing that deal. But there is a lot that we do not know. We didn't know, for example, what the content of that deal was. And a lot of us were really also acting on the back of a particular understanding of what Ethiopia's problem was at the time. So there is a lot that we didn't know what Abiy was doing behind the scene and what his intentions are and what his beliefs were. So when he came initially, he presented himself as somebody that is committed to the multinational federal political project that the country had, that he uh, is somebody that is committed to diversity, plurality, uh, the right of regions to govern themselves at the local level is not often. So he had a significant support at the domestic level, but at the same time, internationally, because of what he was doing within Ethiopia and at the regional level with Eritrea, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by a lot of people, I believe. Um, the Nobel Committee looked at the situation and they said, okay, who is the guy that contributed the most to the cause of peace in the previous year? It's a very, it's not a particularly difficult formula when you look at what the requirements are. It's an award that is given to a single individual or group of individuals that contributed the most to the cause of peace. Because of all the kind of optimism and a hope on the Ethiopian air at the time. Uh, and, and the fact that the situation between Ethiopia and Eritrea was changing. There were some very interesting moments, you know, when the four lines were connected, when people uh, were splintered, um, began to see each other. Uh, you know, that, that was a very good moment, I think by any, by any indication. But of course it is what resulted out of that relationship between Sayas and Abi and led to, this war uh, that is so, so disastrous. So the international community recognized him and the uh, international media uh, was writing about him in a very, uh, um, you know, almost giving him a critical uh, acclaim. Uh, but of course, once Abi Ahmed got to a point where he has to confront Ethiopia's century old problem, he changed. I think he came to the conclusion that the only way he can govern Ethiopia is by embracing the kind of, um, you know, those who have what I describe as the Amhara vision for Ethiopia, basically continuing Menelik's project. These are not just ethnic Amharas, there are also others who subscribe to that view and it's important to understand that in an empire where you have uh, one ethnic group, the culture, the language, the ways of life of that particular group dominates the culture, and that becomes you know, Ethiopia, then of course you have a lot of people who speak that language having more loyalty to that particular, to that particular culture. So Ali you told that this is the most powerful group that he can embrace and continue his particular idea, particular vision for Ethiopia. It's precisely that that plunged Ethiopia into the chaos that we see. It was very clear that this is coming. When Abiy Ahmed uh, dissolved the Prosperity Party and, and, and formed the, uh, the Prosperity, you know, dissolved EPRDF and created the Prosperity Party, I wrote a piece basically arguing that this is bad news for Ethiopia. It would plunge Ethiopia into an abyss. It was very clear for anyone who has followed Ethiopian politics. And I think he made a fatal error in terms of calculating the risks of trying to force his idea of the future on everybody else in the way uh, that he tried. I think that that's what has kind of led to this, um, you know, the most probably unprecedented fall from grace in such a short period of time. I don't know of a leader that's so widely recognized by people at home and people abroad. And suddenly within a short span of time, all that reputation, not just his reputation, the country's reputation as well, um, went down.
uh, the bid. Uh, so my view is that those are the miscalculations that he made, I think that ultimately led to uh, where we are today. Right, uh, terrible. Yes, Yunus, Dr. Yunus. You wanna make comment? Or? No, uh, thank you. Uh, it was quite uh, coverage, I clearly understood. Right, okay. Now we would like to get uh, questions from the participants. Can I? All right, yes, please, uh, dear uh, Bisra, kindly uh, introduce okay. yourself, please, briefly. Okay, thank you, Mr. Abdurhami. And uh, I thank you for the presentation, Mr. Dr. Aulo and uh, Dr. Yunus. I think you can hear me. Yes, yes, yeah. uh, your voice is okay. okay. Uh, did you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes, please. Okay, so my question is, uh, uh, after I, thanks for presentation, for both uh, doctors, I think uh, their understanding for history is somehow, I, I can't uh, understand uh, because uh, Mr. Aulo, uh, Dr. Aulo, Aulo, uh, accept a history after I, I, uh, Ethiopian history as uh, uh, it's not early, but uh, uh, it is after Menelik uh, second. And the one Dr. Yenus accept uh, or present uh, take Ethiopian to back uh, to Ottoman Turkish and pre Ottoman Turkish relation. So, how uh, didn't this uh, how this is uh, uh, take each other or isn't uh, I, I think it's a contradictor so how they understand the ethiopian history uh, as uh, they uh, present so it contradicts for me so uh, if uh, they can Answer about this. Right, Bisrat, could you firstly kindly introduce yourself? Are you a student or are you? Yeah, I'm a student okay. and uh, I'm, I live in here in Ethiopia, okay? Uh, okay, you are a student in Ethiopia, okay. Well, your question is that, uh, well, I... well, dear Dr. Yus, could Yes, you... as as far as I have understood, uh, please uh, correct me, Mr. Uh, Allo, if I'm uh, incorrect. He asked uh, that you initiated your presentation uh, in 19, after 1970s, but I took my case uh, from pre ottoman area to this period. Uh, it was a two different, uh, huge uh, the time period, which both we covered. So he asked, I think, uh, was it contradictory that two presentations clash to each other? That's why that is the right. things he asked, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I believe yes. so. I believe so. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Let me uh, first as a response to him, uh, because we have uh, dealt with two different issues. My topic was covering Turkey Ethiopia relation, which was uh, totally. Uh, uh, unrelated Mr. Uh, uh, Olo's speech because he was talking about uh, uh, the current crisis, uh, source of current crisis, but I cover uh, Turkey Ethiopia relations, uh, but I didn't touch too much in historical background. Uh, I just uh, try to emphasize how the relationship is so deep and so uh, tied to each other uh, from the history right yeah um just just very uh briefly uh, please yes it, it's, it's a good question Bisrat. um i started uh with a particular period in ethiopian history that is the end of the 19th century and i said specifically that is when the modern ethiopian states started with Emperor Menelik. 
Now, Bisrak could disagree with me that that is not when the Ethiopian history started, but for the purpose of my presentation to give you an idea of what led to the current crisis, I didn't need to go beyond Menelik's Ethiopia, okay? So, so I had a very particular purpose. The purpose is to give a picture of how this crisis led to the kind of situation that we are in now. And the most useful starting point from that point of view is the Ethiopian state that was formed and founded uh, by Menelik towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, I, I hope this is not something controversial and over which you can disagree. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, next may, I ask, uh, may I ask one question? Yes, uh, please. Ask, please. Uh, yeah, please kindly introduce yourself briefly. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Bulugita Barisakula. I'm from uh, Dokuzi University, Masters in LLM Candidate International Public Law. Uh, to be honest, uh, yeah, just uh, I'm one of the beneficiaries of Turkish uh, Bursary Scholarship Program. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very glad to participate on this historical program. Uh, so I have one question for His Excellency Doctor. Uh, I will ask, hello. Uh, just my question is, uh, <laughs> of course, the topic is the Turkish-Ethiopian relationship and the fate of Ethiopia and the Turkish relationship. Nowadays, of course, everyone is known. Uh, the Ethiopia and the state of war, the state of disintegration due to the mismanagement of uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, uh, <laughs> while he lived the country for uh, three years. Uh, there is now inclusive political discussion, uh, political situation across the country. Uh, many uh, public figures are under the prison in communicado detention and huge human rights abuse and violation. So my question is, uh, what is the fate of Ethiopia? What is the solution? What is the, the, uh, the possibility to resolve this ongoing conflict? Uh, and what is the role of Turkey as a, as a giant country, as the, uh, we have historical ties, historical relationship between Turkey and Ethiopia. So what is the Turkish government, especially the Turkish administration do in order to resolve this conflict in peaceful ways without uh, uh, uh, causing a serious challenges? So what is the fate? And what, uh, so what's in, what do you forecast to resolve this uh, conflict uh, in the future? Uh, uh, and the second question is, uh, uh, what is the advantage and disadvantage of this conflict to cause on the economy of, I mean, the two bilateral relationship between Turkey and Ethiopia? Uh, specifically, there is a decreasing of investments, uh, all the activities, the country nowadays facing a serious challenge. So what's the most, I mean, the, what is the solution? Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, Mulugate. Really, it was uh, very good questions. Uh, yes, uh, who would like to uh, be first for the answer? Doctor, I will cast him, Allah, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Awo, your question is going to Doctor Awo. Exactly, ah, okay. yeah. Right, yes, please. Uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this is a very difficult question, you know, the question of what is the solution. Um, you know, let alone a random academic like myself, uh, some of the most powerful people on the planet Earth uh, are trying to find uh, a, a peaceful solution forward uh, for this conflict. So it's not a question that has a ready-made answer, um, uh, partly because the political ideological issues that divide the warring faction right now uh, are questions that are so sensitive, so emotional on all groups, on all sides, um, to the point that the Abiy government believe that the only way they can realize this vision of the future is through violence. And now the Tigrayan Defense Forces, after all the violence, they also, I think, came to believe that the only way that things could change is through violence. And I think in Ethiopian culture as a society, I don't think we have the capacity to give peace, dialogue, and negotiation a chance. The people who are leading Ethiopia today are very much the results of Ethiopia's culture. They're not some unique human creatures from somewhere else. 
the, the individuals that were involved in the conflict from all sides are very much a result of the culture. And the culture as such is really no one that is amenable to uh, negotiation to resolve uh, disputes. Um, and of course, when you have the kind of polarization that exists in Ethiopia, the kinds of uh, social division that exists in Ethiopia, the fact that this is about the future and very much fundamentally tied to uh, Ethiopia's history going back uh, all the way to late 19th century, you can see how why everyone on all sides feels uh, so strongly. And I think um, that, I think, gives us an idea of how difficult this is going to be going forward as well to solve the problem. Now, if you look, just look at the last couple of weeks, we were told that uh, the prime minister is going to the battlefront to lead his defense forces. Uh, there were also reports at the same time that there were significant shipments of high-tech uh, drones and other weapons uh, for the Ethiopian side. And at the same time, we saw this orderly coordinated withdrawal of the Tigran defense forces basically without fighting because we have not really seen any evidence of, for example, soldiers uh, that were captured or uh, weapons that were captured. In fact, the Ethiopian side, the government side, was so desperate for some kind of image that they have to drag uh, individuals who were captured from cities, city to grass before uh, television and claiming that these are uh, POWs. Um, and, and I think the, the, the sentiment now is that on the government side, that they are on the cusp of victory and there is no one to negotiate with, there is no need to negotiate with. And I think when TDF and other forces, the Ormo Liberation Army were also close uh, to, to the capital, uh, the sentiment on that side was that there's really no one to negotiate with. Now, as I said earlier, I find it very difficult to see how Abu could be a constructive stakeholder going forward for Ethiopia. But still, you have to negotiate with the various groups uh, that exist in the country, with the ruling party, in every conflict historically, even if the incumbent is to leave office to make way, there has to be some kind of negotiation. So my view is that the best way for Ethiopia is to resolve disputes through dialogue, through negotiation, whatever that is. People have demands, people have long-standing historical questions. You cannot continue to suppress those questions and expect a better country. The more you repress people, the more those repressed groups would organize, they would come back in a way that would uh, be more difficult for the state to control them. And that is what uh, Ethiopia's history shows. But the likelihood of that happening now, as we see, it is very difficult unless something uh, happens. Now, what could be the role of Turkey is the other interesting question that you raised. And I am finding it very difficult uh, how Turkish diplomacy came to the conclusion or that by supporting Abiy Ahmed, Turkey could preserve its interest. Now, I understand this is, this is broader in some ways in the sense that um, Turkey is not just acting solely um, in terms of it is immediate economic interest in Ethiopia. There are far broader issues uh, why they want to have continued political influence uh, in the Horn of Africa. As I, said earlier, as I said earlier, uh, there were these you know, three groups that I tried to identify, the Qatar, Ankara, Axis, the Arab axis, including UAE, Saudi Arabia, but also Egypt, Yemen, and then you have uh, you have uh, Iran. All of this group were vying for influence in the Horn of Africa. That is a much broader geostrategic interest that is not confined to simply economic interest. So my assessment is that Turkey and Turkish policymakers or people in, in this uh, policy space. Uh, I think came to the conclusion that the best way their interests could be protected is by supporting uh, the government. Maybe Turkey is also interested in um, uh, preventing a certain kind of precedent from being set uh, in the Horn of Africa. My own assessment is that um, 
given the kind of Ethiopia's history that I was setting out for you guys and the central political question, I think it would be highly problematic to defend and justify supporting one group over another while your long-term interest is tied not to these groups, but to, to the country and to the state uh, overall. But I think Turkey can always uh, make amends, can always uh, change its policy. It can be a constructive, uh, positive player uh, going forward. Once again, I mean, I, I don't exactly know how much of Turkish drones are being used today, but the, the uh, information in the public domain suggests that uh, Turkish uh, drones were being used, and that would obviously create uh, resentment and, and, and disappointment on the part of those uh, who are opposed uh, to the war. Uh, but I do hope that Turkey uh, would uh, continue to play, uh, kind of step back, reassess these positions and, and, and play a more constructive role that is in the interest of the Ethiopian public, but also in the interest of Turkey over the long term. Sorry, I took long. Right. Uh, well, not at all. It was really uh, uh, right. Uh, very, uh, very, very good uh, answer. Yes, Mulugeta, are you happy with the answer? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Awala Kassan. Uh, very good, nice uh, uh, answer and really appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Okay. Well, I think because of the uh, limited time, uh, Dr. Awol, he uh, well, gave uh, answer about uh, the question regarding uh, Turkey's involvement in Ethiopia, how Turkey can uh, uh, be a peacemaker. Uh, well, uh, but what about Dr. Yunus' perspective? Dr. Yunus, uh, well, how Turkey uh, can be a peace uh, maker in Ethiopia. Yes, uh, well, uh, we know that uh, Turkey has a very strong engagement in the region, in Somalia. Uh, well, uh, Turkey has a very unique uh, experience in Eth Ethiopia, state building process. Turkey uh, has actively involved in the state building process. And yes, it's a fact that actually it was a uh, a, a great uh, success uh, for the uh, for for for for Turkey because uh, in a short time, uh, well, uh, Turkey uh, became also a, well a symbol of humanitarian a new kind of humanitarian activities in the uh, in the Somalia directly provided okay humanitarian assistance for the needy people and not only humanitarianism but also. Uh, well, in infrastructure development assistance, well, uh, especially in Somali, Turkey uh, has a very unique uh, experience in Somali. But as you mentioned, uh, Turkey also is the second investor in Ethiopia. Uh, well, after China, that uh, uh, must be examined very carefully. Well, during the Justice and Development Party, well, Ethiopia also has a very special place for the for Turkey. And there are many businessmen and Turkish uh, factories. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, how how Turkey can be can be a peacemaker uh, in Ethiopia? Because, uh, well, uh, uh, this uh, problem, this uh, crisis, definitely is going to uh, also reduce uh, the impact or the relations of Turkey with the, with the countries in the region. What would you like to say? Uh, that is the uh, one of the hot topic uh, in today's discussions. Uh, since the, the great crisis erupted, I have been following how Turkish leaders has reacted to this crisis. Uh, I would clearly emphasize that Turkish leaders, from the ministers to high-level high level, uh, positions, have refrained from direct involvement to the conflict. I would clearly say that because Turkey has uh, had a big mistake, I would say, I would say had a big mistake to involve 
several conflicts which took place around itself. So in this, uh, and after 2018, Turkish authorities are so careful in engaging any conflict in the world. So uh, the reason why Turkish authorities didn't, uh, I mean, involve directly to the Ethiopian case or in, an, in any other case in Africa or in other parts of the, uh, the world, world. They change their policy. Turkish foreign policy is now changing to, uh, to involve directly to the crisis because uh, now Turkey is dealing with several uh, issues or uh, problems coming from Syria, coming from in other regions. Now, Turkey is more uh, calm, I would say that. And, and Turkish authorities never criticize, I mean, and, and never, uh, never uh, positions itself, either AB side or the opposition side in the Tigray crisis. But as a state to state relations, Turkey as a state and Ethiopia is a state. And Abi still assuming the power and still leader of Ethiopia. So Turkey, um, as a naturally contact to Abi Ahmed due to his uh, ongoing uh, presidency. That's why, uh, but Turkey often criticize any human rights violations without mentioning the any side, either from the government side or the Tigray side. Just criticize the humanitarian crisis uh, without mentioning any side which who were right or who were wrong. That's why uh, Turkish policy to Ethiopia is quite, uh, I would say, uh, Turkey staying uh, far, beyond the regions in terms of this crisis. As your questions, Mr. Uh, Sreda, how Turkey can be a peace dealer? Well, at the moment, uh, to be a peacemaker, your position has to be accepted by both sides. As Ella mentioned that, there is a huge, uh, I would say, image uh, at the eyes of Tigray's people about Turkey, that Turkey has been involving the crisis so deeply due to sending its military equipment and missions. That's why uh, for the present, it's difficult to be accepted Turkish position by Tigray or uh, the others uh, uh, groups. So, uh, but when the, uh, the conflict between opposite, opposite group in Ethiopia, has set a new path. I mean, getting the negotiation or uh, coming on the table, Turkey can easily set its experts on mediation, such as Turkey has played many role in mediation in, in, in Middle East, in different parts of the regions. Turkey can uh, export its experience on finding a solution uh, between different groups to solve the problems. But as I said at the beginning of the my at the end of the my speech, Turkey never would like to see any would like to see any scenario which Ethiopia economically dis and politically dissolved, because in that case Turkey will lose its huge investment in Ethiopia. Fine. Okay. Uh, thank you, dear Yunus, Dr. Yunus. Uh, we can, if you don't mind, dear speakers, uh, uh, let's get uh, a few questions from the participants because uh, we couldn't get more questions. Uh, yes, any questions different from different participants? Right, okay. Uh, Aleykümselam. Aleykümselam. Go ahead. Nasıl sesin hocam? Uh, uh, good, good evening. Good evening. Teş teşekkür ediyorum Muhammed. Hoş geldin. Hoş geldin. Buyurun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Kendini lütfen tanıtırsan <gülüyor> seviniriz. Kısaca. İyiyim elhamdülillah. Çok şükür. İyiyim elhamdülillah. Kendini tanıtırsan really, seviniriz. Really? Think I, it use yourself. İyi elhamdülillah. Uh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. I'm Muhammad Saleh. I live in Istanbul. I'm from uh, the African Center for Research and uh, Policy Studies here in Istanbul, which is established, uh, established uh, since here. I thank uh, uh, the organizing this uh, session. Uh, then uh, really I catch uh, just the last uh, 30 minutes of uh, the discussion and questions, but because the, the, the issue as general is uh, very important for me, as one of the people of uh, the Horn of Africa, I'm originally from Eritrea. Um, thank you, Dr. Allo, because uh, I was one of his uh, following uh, when he was uh, appearing in, uh, in media and TV, uh, televisions, but he disappeared uh, last uh, time, I think, uh, for many reasons I know. I have two questions, Dr. Alo. This is directly to Dr. Alo. Uh, the first one is that we know before 19, 2019, the main pushing power to the change was the Kiro youth and, and, and the majority of, uh, of Roma people. Now, I, I, I don't understand in these conflicts what, what, is, what is the situation and what is their stance uh, uh, regarding this uh, this conflict, because as you know, when I, I have I have I have following the, the the conflict from the from the beginning until now, I know some details. I know the I know, but the the the the, the, the political stance of the uh, of the Oromo people as general uh, after the uh, imprisonment of, uh, of the of the political leaders of Romia, this is one. Second was the second one is uh, why Abi Ahmed went to Eritrea and bring the the Eritrean forces to to in the in the inside conflicts. I know Asiasa Forke has a big problem with the grants. I know that, but if you have any else justification on this issue, Doctor Al, thank you very much. Shall I respond? Yes, please, please. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Mohammed. Those are very good questions. Um, <clears throat> the first question, uh, what is the position, the view of the Oromo public today? Uh, I think if there is any group today in Ethiopia that feels uh, completely betrayed uh, by Abi, uh, completely uh, rejected, uh, having paid all the sacrifice to bring about a change in government and put all their hopes on Abiy Ahmed and his friends so that they could respond to the fundamental political question the Oromos have been asking for the last three, four years. It is the Oromos, right? Um, but the Oromos traditionally gravitated towards a peaceful struggle. So the Cairo movement that you mentioned uh, in this uh, text, mess, text that you sent, uh, that ushered Abiy Ahmed to power, that forced EPRDF to fracture internally uh, and bring about that hopeful moment of change that we saw in Ethiopia, has been systematically and wickedly eliminated from the political scene. Its leaders were imprisoned. The top leaders, as you know, people like Yuar Muhammad, they are in jail. but individual organizers on the ground, right, that were behind that uh, highly disciplined, peaceful uh, movement have been locked behind bars. So I have alluded in my presentation, if you paid attention that Abiyu's political repression started in Oromia, the most important regional state in the country. And I talked about why that was important for him. He cannot afford to have significant rebellion in his own region, historically from that region, and at the same time hope to lead the country. He cannot allow that kind of rebellion that would ultimately lead to him losing election. If Abi were to run a democratic election against people like Jawar, the Oromo Liberation Front, Oromo Federal Congress, there is no way that his prosperity party can win an election. 
So what did he do? He basically used police and intelligence forces to eliminate them. Those who refused basically left the political process and there were now, you know, they are now insurgents fighting in the Oromo Liberation Army. Um, and so in this conflict, one of the things that the Oromo public realized is that the only way you can actually defend yourself, the only way you can retain some semblance of dignity as people is if you are armed like Tigrayans. Well, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the Tigrayan case and the Eritrean case very shortly, but one of the things that we saw, that if, if people like Jawar Mohammed, Bekalegar, but people who were absolutely committed to peaceful struggle could be locked behind bars, if the Tigrayans could be punished for holding an election, right? Then how does peaceful struggle work in this context? Because those who have chosen to fight in the, through peaceful method are locked behind bars. So a lot of young people now within Oromia regional states are supporting the Oromo Liberation Army because they see no prospect of a peaceful, vibrant movement emerging uh, under Abi Ahmed. So the majority of Oromos within the Oromia regional states support uh, uh, the various groups that are fighting for them, uh, but they are completely opposed to the kind of vision that Abi Ahmed has for Ethiopia. So Abi does not have support in Oromia. Now, in terms of the Isaiah's uh, Afro work um, uh, involvement in, in um, Eritrea, two things that I would like to say here. Uh, you know, obviously, when one country decides to enter a conflict in another country, it doesn't do that just because it wanted to help another state. There has to be something in it for, for it. There has to, uh, it has to have its own interest. So Isaias has always wanted to make TPLF pay right, for the war in uh, 1990, 2000, and the long diplomatic isolation that Isaias suffered. He was very bitter. He was waiting for an opportunity and Abiy Ahmed gave him that opportunity to make the Tigrayans pay. Okay, so for, from his perspective, it's primarily an exercise in vengeance, but he's also somebody who wants to be the kingmaker in the whole of Africa. He has this grandiosity that he is of course the leader who has been there the, you know, the longest um, and, and he has even been leading uh, his movement for an even longer period before Eritrea became uh, independent. Uh, so this is somebody who has all his life worked on security, on military. Eritrea had really nothing else going for it the last 30 years. And he wanted to be this dominant figure and he wanted to uh, weaken TPLF because he also feels that they could represent a threat to him uh, if uh, they remain in power and strengthened. That's one thing. The other um, dimension to this is that, you know, when Abi and Isaias began this relationship, it was very clear that the relationship was one that is anchored in their personal connection than, than policy or a long-term strategic alignment between the two countries. Uh, they had a common threat that is uh, TPLF they agreed that the best way forward for the two countries is to eliminate TPLF. And their calculation was that if Ethiopian Defense Forces, the Amara Forces from the south of the country march up north and the uh, Tigray Defense Forces, sorry, the, the Eritrean Forces march from north to south, then they can very easily sandwich Tigray and do whatever they want, complete the war, um, arrest, kill, uh, to grow our leadership and then complete uh, the mission. But as we saw, it was a calamitous mis miscalculation that backfired. Abi basically said that this is going to be a very short, precise surgical operation that could be completed in a matter of weeks. And then when they removed TPLF from power uh, in, in, in November, towards the end of November, uh, you remember he basically told people that the Tigray Liberation Front is now is, is a kind of a flower that is spread into air, that it could not come back. Well, they came back 
they not only came back, they forced the Ethiopian defense forces from their region. They marched all the way to uh, almost Debra Berhan, uh, significantly threatened uh, the capital city itself. Uh, and so the primary motive on the part of Isaias is his own interest to exact vengeance on TPLF and Tigrayans, but there are also these other broader considerations. His interest to be, you know, the, the big kingmaker in the region, of course, supporting Abi and having influence in Ethiopia as well. Thank you very much, Doctor. All right, dear uh, Doctor Abu, can we make this comment? Uh, as uh, as we know that the uh, uh, People's Liberation Front uh, was in power for uh, for for thirty years in the country, and which means that uh, well, uh, in the uh, military service, in the uh, bureaucracy, in the security, well, uh, the uh, Tigray uh, people and uh, the, the, the main party was so influential. So, but uh, when the, uh, Abi Ahmed uh, came to power, uh, well, after one year after he got the Nobel Prizes, well, suddenly he changed the policy, well, against the uh, Tigray People's Liberation Front. Well, uh, can we say that, well, uh, he made a very uh, strategic mistake in the country because well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, it was uh, it is important to uh, estimate that okay, who is uh, uh, powerful in the country, and what is your power, and what is your bureaucratic power in the country. Well, but just after one year, uh, he, you are gonna uh, make a war against the Tigray. Uh, uh, that was in power for uh, for 30 years, for the last 30 years in the country, um, which is a significant uh, situation well, uh, for the uh, for the for understanding the history, the modern history of the country and the current developments. Uh, I think well, uh, uh, well about democratization, about uh, well relations with the uh, with, with the countries, with the neighbor, uh, well, the people's liberation uh, front policy is still is uh, in effect is effective. So therefore, without uh, or you know uh, without understanding the impact of the of this fact, I think it can be problematic uh, for the uh, for the uh, for for the government of Abi Abi Ahmed. What do you think? It is now. Well, do you agree or no? I think that is a, a very sound uh, analysis, uh, Abdul Rahim, because uh, uh, he, you know, when I said Abi made a calamitous miscalculation, that is precisely what I was referring to. Uh, one of the things that he completely forgot to take into account is the kind of political socialization that happened in Ethiopia over the 30, almost 30-year 30 period when EPRD was in power from 1991. Abiy's vision is one that wants to um, make Ethiopia great again. Hmm. Most people... Uh, in Ethiopia today are people who were born since 1991, right? The majority of people, especially those uh, who would go and fight. And most of these people don't see any glorious past behind the kind of state that Abi is talking about. So the, the vision that Abi offers is one that is antithetical to the vision that the majority of people in Tigray, in Oromia, in this historically marginalized group, believe. So I don't think Abi estimated, I, I don't think he uh, properly uh, assessed the determination of Tigrayan youth to rise up and fight against the kind of political vision that he's offering. Okay, that's one thing. So he did not very carefully look at the kind of socialization that happened 
over the last 30 or so years. And secondly, um, I don't think he has seriously looked at the military culture, uh, the advantage that Tigrayans had uh, in the military for a long period of time uh, in Ethiopia since uh, 1991, as you rightly pointed out. That experience is huge, right? The reason why Tigray was able to put up this kind of fights and the Oromos in the Oromia region are not, is because Tigrayans have a particular advantage while running the Ethiopian state. The Oromos reject Abiy's vision in the same way that the Tigrayans reject his vision. The Oromos feel very strongly about what Abiy did, just as Tigrayans do. But the Oromos are about maybe five times the size or six times the size of Tigrayans. Why is it that they were unable to put up significant pressure as Tigrayans? Because they did not have the kind of structural advantage that comes with controlling the state. So Abiy failed to uh, calculate the military capacity, their resilience, uh, their ability to, uh, to sustain uh, a long grueling battle. I also think that he didn't particularly consider how the geography of Tigray is probably suitable to the kind of war that they are uh, they are used to. So Abi miscalculated in so many ways. I think he also miscalculated what the response of the international community would be. He told that he can impose a complete communication blackout and then uh, complete the war in a short period of time. Uh, so these are these are you know some of I think the blunders. But you know even then even then because Abi is leading a country of 100 plus million people and a huge army against a region of six, seven million people with the support of Eritrea, with the support of the UAE drones. I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't think that they can wipe these people, this group out in a short period of time? But of course, as a leader who is taking significant political risks, significant risk with the life of a nation your calculation, your assessment, your analysis of any war has to be very, very deep. It should have taken all of these things into account. You are a state, you are in control of state, you have everything available to you. Um, and he failed to do that. And I think as a result of that, the country is now, um, the population is now paying a terrible price. Right. Okay. Well, I th thank you, uh, dear uh, doctor. I think tomorrow is weekend, so we can uh, continue to get more questions, eh? isn't it? <laughs> Not really. um, exactly. Well, I am uh, going to well, finish the uh, finish the program. Well, uh, well, but uh, well, I, well, if one one the last question for the Yunus, doctor Yunus Turhan. And uh, if there is no question, I have a question for him if from the participants. Sorry, I have to close. I have to finish the program because, well, uh, even though tomorrow is a weekend, uh, so uh, I think time is up uh, indeed. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Yunus, uh, briefly, uh, as you know, that Turkey when uh, uh, when Turkey. Uh, began to get involved in, in African politics uh, activity uh, since 2005. Well, especially Somalia became a very special country. And uh, uh, well, especially Turkey's soft power, Turkey's soft power uh, uh, has been uh, one of the most critical uh, components of Turkish foreign policy in the uh, African politics, as we know that. Uh, from uh, soft power as a humanitarian activities and infrastructure development assistance, uh, etc. But well, uh, and after the uh, after the especially when the uh, arms spin started, uh, Turkish foreign policy has been also changed uh, in the African in the African continents from the soft power to uh, 
uh, well security oriented foreign policy because uh, well uh, Turkey as as as you know that uh, also uh, established um, uh, as a huge uh, military base or training uh, base in Somalia and also uh, well uh, has been making agreements many agreements uh, with the African countries in the field of defense and security so uh, well, how do we explain it? Well, in Ethiopia also, well, uh, Turkey is uh, increasing, especially in the Horn of Africa, increasing its uh, security relations. Do you believe that uh, well, uh, Turkey's uh, new policy in African politics uh, has the similar with the uh, France uh, for security policy? Because France also has a military base and protecting its uh, national interest and uh, interest of the French uh, companies. Now, do you believe that, uh, well, uh, Turkey is the, uh, well, uh, security policy is same or, uh, well, or changing, Turkey is changing its uh, foreign policy in the whole of Africa around recently? What would you like to say? Yes, I know that it's a deep question, but Time also is uh, problematic, but uh, your comment is really valuable. Thank you. As you said that it's a huge uh, and very deep question, which actually we need to uh, set a new uh, program <laughs> to discuss this issue in a, in, a, in a different period. But I can clearly explain that <clears throat> and briefly. Turkey uh, involved Africa in 1998 uh, with diplomatic missions than the economic attachment, then the final phase of this attachment included military aspect. It was an expected result because any country who is seeking a new position or seeking to uh, expand its sphere of influence in any part of the world needs to be supported by military uh, wings. I would say that I, I, I may be labeled as a poor realist, but I can confess that military powers uh, secure your positions in any regions. Turkey, of course, do not follow the same step that France or UK or Portuguese uh, is taking in Africa, because we don't, uh, Turkey do not directly involve the conflict. I mean, Turkey do not send its soldiers in Mali or Senegal or in other parts of the Africa as France does. But Turkey, uh, this Turkey-Somali relations is totally uh, uh, exceptional in this case because Turkey is uh, really uh, touching the heart of the Somali's politics because until 2011, Somali was never, was, uh, has never met uh, to be success as, as a successful state. But uh, after Turkey involved to Somalia in 2011, and a year later, Somali uh, government has been established. So Turkey involved Somalia to uh, rehabilitate a new nations, which at the end of the day has been successful because Somalia, if it's as uh, stable, uh, country, uh, I mean, it's not a full stable, but uh, relatively stable compare, compared to before Turkey and after Turkey, Turkey's mission has been successful. But Turkey's aim is not to be uh, as hard power as the France or UK's. Turkey still employ its soft, soft power uh, in, uh, increasingly day by day because the Turkish scholarship has been increased to 20,000 African uh, students are taking education at the moment. And Turkey's foreign aid has been increasing day, year, day by day. But military, of course, uh, needs to be uh, handled in different aspects. And Turkey, uh, of course, it was an expected reality uh, to be, uh, to be uh, part of the Africa in military aspect. Did I response? Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. More than enough because of time problem. And yeah. yes, it was it was really uh, enough answer. Thank you. Maybe you could, could consider uh, making another program for this specific question. 
Well, uh, okay, let's close the program and uh, dear scholars and dear participants, uh, really thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I hope, I believe that it was really fruitful and a very, very uh, uh, good program and uh, opening the new, uh, new uh, horizons, academic horizons, and uh, really understanding uh, the dynamic changing uh, the regions and in Ethiopia, especially Turkey, Africa perspective. Um, uh, thank you so much, dear Dr. Alo, really, well, you joined uh, and you accept our kind invitation. We are very happy that, really, thank you. And Dr. Yunus Turan, also really, thank you so much, well, uh, you came to our program. And uh, right, would you like to say what thing or we can close? Dr. Alo, Dr. Yunus. I would like to say thank you for everyone to be uh, to be patient at nearly two and a half hours. Uh... <laughs> right, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, you are right. I'm sorry, I kept it very long program, but uh, we got questions and it was okay. And especially tomorrow was really Doctor Alo. I just want to thank uh, you all for organizing. Um, a really interesting uh, conversation. This is my second time, I think, um, addressing a primarily Turkish audience. Um, it's a Turkish country... audience. Your Turkish uh, audience is increasing in Turkey. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, no, but it's uh, it's it's a fascinating country. I like uh, Turkish history, and I I love the country. I've only been there once, but uh, uh, so it's a it's a pleasure uh, to be speaking to you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and thank also you. thank you to everyone uh, behind you who were uh, supporting to make this a reality. Thank you and good evening. Have a nice weekend. Thank All you. The best. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. For Bye -bye. For Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you for your technical support. Right. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All the best. All the best.